are defines how you build. So I want to talk about the current situation in the tech ecosystem. Uh, this is Ryan Craig, who's a managing partner of what used to be known as University Ventures and recently changed their name. And he says, those of us under age 50 have known nothing but a bull market in inequality. A Little bit wake you up, make you think. And our next quote, genius is evenly distributed by zip code, opportunity is not. So that drives a lot of what we do at Cape War Capital and the other organizations that I'll be talking about briefly. So um, I want to talk about a few things here. I want to talk about our current climate, what we're seeing in tech, especially in employee activism, in CEO uh, activism, hashtag me too, how that's come into the uh, tech ecosystem, challenges, access and inequality. A question being raised very recently, who is indeed self-made? Um, is this country, is any educational institution, including the one where we are now, a real meritocracy? And why or why not? I want to talk about a leaky tech pipeline. There's lots of debate on is there or is there not a, a pipeline problem. Talk a little bit about a, a study we did about who leaves tech and why. Then I'm going to go into Cape or Capital, our investment criteria, our founder's commitment, uh, who we are, a little bit about who's in our portfolio, and why I'm incredibly hopeful. Um, pot companies is not what you think, although we did our first cannabis investment recently. Pot companies, people ops tech. Uh, we have, this will be the fifth year, we're running a people ops tech pitch competition, looking at seed stage tech startups that are leveraging that technology to mitigate bias in all aspects of sourcing, hiring, interviewing, promotion, compensation, performance review, uh, succession planning, and then SMASH. SMASH is a Summer Math and Science Honors Academy program I co-founded 16 years ago, has a chapter actually on this very campus, and then some ideas to ponder as we move into uh, questions. So here are some things that have been going on in very recently in our tech ecosystem. We had 20,000 Google employees walk out in November over responses uh, to a sexual harassment uh, situation uh, about a, uh, someone who left with a $90 million severance packet. Uh, and also, more recently, challenging a board member uh, for the AI organization. And 2,500 Googlers signed a petition to get that person removed. We have a very new climate of employee activism in tech. I would not have predicted that, uh, and it's popping up lots of places. Uh, this is the, the new AI council, where the 2,500 employees just, this is within the last week, demanding this person not be present. Then you've got CEO activism. Uh, you've got somebody saying, I'm going to take a hit to my profits. I'm not going to sell guns anymore. Uh, you've got executives seeing positive impact on their companies for taking uh, what they see as a social values-based kind of stand. Nike, in promoting Colin Kaepernick, took a bold, clear stand on a divisive issue um, and earned $6 billion in the process. And we're seeing both what are seen as blue and red company CEOs are um, saying that they can't sit on the sidelines. So used to be that our workplaces were a little bit of a safe space from politics, and now they're sort of right there in the middle of it, which poses big questions for you as engineers, as leaders, future leaders, about what stand do you take? What kind of company do you work for? So we've seen a lot going on, hashtag me too. There's a new group. Um, actually, our foundation is one of the 11 foundations that we've pooled $20 million uh, to go support the on-the-ground work of women organizing domestic workers, hotel workers, uh, you know, across farm workers, uh, tech workers, Hollywood. Um, so 
we're seeing a lot going on in individual workplaces in reaction to hashtag Me Too. Those of you who've been looking at it in the tech sector, you know that CEOs have lost their jobs, like SoFi, uh, because of harassment. You know that venture capitalists have been kicked out of their firms. Firms have imploded, like Binary. So these are current and troubling issues. We've got this either or view of diversity and inclusion in, in, in the tech ecosystem. And for any of you who are on Twitter, you'll see these debates about there is a pipeline problem, there isn't a pipeline problem, it's a tech culture problem. I think that's the wrong framing, whichever way you look at it. I think we've got a set of systemic biases and barriers that explain our pipeline problem and that explain the ways in which tech culture are not really inclusive to everyone. And we're not talking about bigots. We're not talking about intent here. We're talking about what has grown up and the ways in which biases have gotten filtered into our systems, which is what got the Googlers uh, riled up about AI because <coughs> of the fears about the bias that gets built into AI. We have something going on now. Uh, you may have, have seen Kylie Jenner described as a self-made millionaire. Billionaire. Uh, and a lot of people said, what? What is self-made about what she's done? Uh, she was you know, born on third base. And she didn't hit a home run. Uh, she might have gotten walked in. Um, and then we see things that are actually affecting this very campus with the college admissions scandal. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what is a meritocracy. We can have the aspiration to be a meritocracy. There's some very interesting, rigorous research on that second headline there, meritocracy doesn't exist and believing it does is bad for you. Uh, there's some really interesting, it's mostly out of the field of social psychology, about what happens when uh, companies put in meritocratic processes. There's a, a, a professor at Sloan School at MIT who's written about the paradox of meritocracy. Uh, and what happens when meritocracy is an explicit goal of a company, managers make less meritocratic decisions because they think somebody else is taking care of it. Quite fascinating. So here is an interesting thing when we look at are we self-made uh, or not. And this is, is success determined by luck and the percent who answered yes by income? So the higher your income, the less likely you are to say that happened by luck, the more likely you are to say, I did that all by myself. Um, and the less income you have, the more you will say luck is a huge uh, factor there. So I want to walk you through a couple of composites. I have been working on college admissions. I've been working on college access programs for a few decades now. And I want to illustrate this issue about the biases that underlie things uh, that get us to have a tech system that looks like what we do. So let's take a couple of composite characters. We'll call them Brandon and Juanita. And this is while they're in K-12 education. So somebody's got high-tech computer labs in their school. Somebody's got no science. Uh, labs, no computer labs. Completely accidents of zip code. Um, I don't know, anybody in this room choose their parents? Anybody choose the zip code in which you were born? That's what these issues that we're wrestling with today are asking us to think about it. So when does the teacher think you're going to succeed? We know you're going to go far. When do you get those messages of encouragement? And when do you have low teacher expectations? When does the teacher say, mm, I think that's too many AP classes for you? Uh, I don't think you're Stanford material. Uh, that gets said every day to high school students from low income backgrounds. So going about how many AP classes are taken. Um, I'm working with a bunch of college admissions officers uh, now to look at, we ought to be thinking about the denominator 
of AP classes when we're looking at college admissions. If you took three AP classes in high school and you're up against somebody who took 27, I wanna know if you took all three of the ones offered at your school and the one who took 27 took half of the AP classes. It tells you, gives you a whole different vantage point on those students. So we wanna make sure that we are indeed rewarding merit or achievement, not rewarding access or privilege. Who's got after school STEM programs? Who works after school? Whose family hires them an SAT coach? Uh, who can't afford an SAT class? Do any college admissions uh, applications ask how many times you took the SAT? Um, maybe we ought to think about ways that we could actually do that. Try to get move along here to college, go to a top 10 school, go to the community college so that you can save money and live at home. Um, how do you pay for school? If, your family, if you're lucky enough to have your family pay for school, which is wonderful, it means you can participate in lots of things. It means you can take a job at a startup. If you're graduating with six figures in loans, you're not gonna be able to afford a startup salary. So we right away determine by birth who has access to what kind of future. Who can afford an unpaid internship? Only somebody who's got somebody else to support them. Uh, so there are many folks that are now trying to make unpaid internships um, illegal, if you will, or not permissible. Um, who's got to work part time over the summer to put food on their family's table? Who has a role model? There's a lot of fascinating literature. Uh, there's a professor, um, Buju Dasgupta at UMass Amherst, who's done a study for women of color, any uh, racial minority woman, if you have one professor in four or five years that looks like you, it makes a statistically significant difference in your major and your grade point average. So we ought to think about just who is it that you're exposed to as role models and how different uh, that makes the outcome. Who can hire a tutor? Who can't even go to the free study session because they've got to have a work study job? And so we just forget about all of these subtle barriers that nobody put in anybody's way intentionally. Nobody said, aha, let's make it much harder for Juanita than Brandon. But day-to-day -day life is indeed much harder. So let's look at what happens as we go to the workplace. Who sends recruiters to your college? Recruiters don't go to community colleges. Who submits resumes cold? Who taps a personal network? Um, who doesn't know anyone? Uh, I'll talk a little about our SMASH program, but most of our SMASH scholars from the Bay Area don't know anyone who works in tech. That's pretty amazing. Coming in via employee referral. Employee referral is one of the most biased hiring mechanisms that exists uh, because in this country, we, our friendships, and, and there's a nonprofit that's done a lot of research on this, all of us tend to have friends who look like us, whatever group we are in, which means if you've got a perfectly diverse workplace, an employee referral system is great because it will continue that. If you don't have a diverse company employee base and you put an employee referral system in, it's actually just gonna replicate who's still here. Uh, so the same thing, who feels like they can, the salary differences, we're getting a lot of attention paid to pay equity these days. Who feels like they can negotiate? Who gets punished if they can negotiate? Who feels at home in the workplace culture and uh, who feels like I don't really fit? Um, who gets promoted in the first year and who becomes a lever? And that's what our tech lever study was all about. Who leaves tech and why? Uh, single greatest reason that women of color leave tech is being passed over for promotion. For those who aren't quite sure about is there a pipeline problem or not, um, 
Let me just very quickly show you AP Computer Science Test Takers by Race and Ethnicity. Uh, and so you've got the, the darker bar is the K-12 population, and the lighter bar is AP Computer Science participation. So you can just see for white, for Asian, you can see the differences by racial and ethnic group about who has access to who takes AP Computer Science. So by looking at that, we understand we don't have um, a steady pipeline. So if you combine Hispanic, Latinx, Black, African American, grand total is 16 uh, percent. Gender, AP computer science test takers, just under one quarter are, are women. That is the pipeline problem. What explains that is the bias problem. Technical employees by race at top uh, tech companies large tech companies in, in particular. Uh, Venture-backed founders by race and ethnicity. Uh, Latinx don't even get come up there. So pre-K 12 education. Uh, this is about women and girls of color in computing. This is a big collaborative of, of about 15 researchers. Um, that we are participating in. Melinda Gates's Pivotal uh, Ventures Group is uh, participating in. Uh, researchers from across the country trying to figure out how to get more girls and women of all backgrounds into computing and getting in tech and staying in tech. Among all women employed in computer and information science occupations, only 12% are black or Latinx. And you see the tech companies spending a lot of time and a lot of money trying to uh, work on diversity and not having the baseline data to work from. 80% of new small businesses are started by uh, black women. And, but they account for less than 4% of the VC money. So again, it's not about a lack of an entrepreneurial appetite. Um, it's again an access issue. So the tech lever study that I mentioned, that you can get, you can just Google it, it's on the web for free. Uh, a couple of thousand engineers, who leaves tech and why? It was done two years ago, four findings. Unfairness drives turnover costs billions a year, experiences differ dramatically between groups, but specific initiatives can and do make a difference if they're formulated uh, accurately. 37% said that unfair treatment was the most frequently cited reason for leaving. Um, twice as many left because they felt treated unfairly in their workplace as were recruited away. And that's across all groups. And the unfairness differs. 40% uh, men of color were most likely to leave due to unfair treatment. Experiences differed dramatically across those groups. Um, and this includes things that are not about race or about gender. These include things like bullying. Um, one in 10 women experienced unwanted sexual attention. Uh, which has, as we talked about, been getting more attention. 30% of women of color passed over for promotion, single greatest reason. Turnover, $16 billion uh, for unfair treatment in employee replacement costs annually, and that's just the turnover costs. It's fairly standardly and conservatively accepted what is the cost to replace a person. So it'd be cheaper to fix it. Um, we also asked the leavers, what would have made you stay? Um, and we asked them how their experience impacts their willingness to refer a friend, a family member, someone else to that company. So 35%, slightly more than a third, said, no, based on my experience, I can't recommend that company as a place to work, nor can I recommend its products and services. So if you want to try to calculate that cost, um, that is one that is not in the 16 billion. Economists don't agree on how to calculate that kind of reputational hit. 
But the good news, a comprehensive approach can and does make a difference, both in reducing unfair treatment and in uh, increasing retention or reducing turnover. So the majority, if you ask people what would have kept you, they have an answer. The majority would have stayed if they felt like there was a place to go to get their problem fixed. Right? And we're not talking about a formal complaint. We're not talking about a lawsuit. We're talking about practical problem-solving mechanisms where they feel like who they can go to is impartial, an impartial third party, for instance. There were five specific measures we tested for. Having a head of diversity and inclusion doesn't make a statistically significant difference, either in the amount of unfairness or in the amount of turnover. Second thing we, here are all the ones we tested for, setting explicit diversity goals and underrepresented employee referral bonuses. Actually, those two independently make a statistically significant difference. Conducting unconscious bias training does not, how many have gone through unconscious bias training? Didn't make a difference, right? We wasted some time. Might have been fun, might have been interesting. Doesn't make a statistically significant difference in reducing unfairness or increasing uh, retention. Employee resource groups, many companies, virtually all tech companies, including young startups, have employee resource groups. And indeed, those can be uh, great ways to meet colleagues, compare notes on who's a good manager, how do you get promoted around here, but again, doesn't make a statistically significant difference. What does make a difference, actually, besides these two individual uh, kinds of initiatives, is all five together. All five make more of a difference uh, than just those two independently. So I want to switch to something else, which is how do you create companies that take all this information into account? So I know you're talking about social impact companies, you're talking about Sparks, you're talking about sustainability. There's a prevailing view that social impact is separate from economic value, and that investing in social enterprises means is concessionary towards returns, that you're giving those up. We actually don't think about that at Cape Or Capital. We think the other way to think about it is that the overlap of social impact and economic value, you can find that both are driven from the same source. So here are our investment criteria. We have about 130 companies in our portfolio. We're going to be releasing our returns for the first time ever on May 8th. We do seed stage tech startups. Uh, the core business, not the philanthropic effort, not the CSR, not a side effort, the core business closes gaps of access and or opportunity and or outcome for low income communities and or communities of color. We have not found any problem with deal flow. People were very worried about that. We had more than 3,000 deals come across our desks last year. Uh, and we invest in somewhere between 10 and 15 a year. In 2016, we became the first venture capital firm to implement a founder's commitment. That was January of 2016. We don't write a check unless the CEO makes a commitment to building a welcoming culture and a diverse team. We are not prescriptive at all. We say to our founders, depending on who your customers are, we think that your aspiration should be that your employee mix matches your customer base. And if you think about it, it sounds like a good business practice. So if you're selling into public schools in the US, K-12, you're going to have a very different demographic than if you are a fintech company and you are a B2B company and your clients are 
Wall Street. Uh, so all of this is on the website. Those are some of our companies. You might recognize some names there. So when we ask them how to implement this, we ask them to look at four things. And there's a, an acronym of GIVE here. Set goals. And again, they set their own goals. We're not, we're not prescribing it. We're asking them to set goals that help them realize their business goals. Uh, we ask them to invest in tools and resources and training that are going to help them mitigate bias in their product development, in their hiring, that, again, is just going to make them a better business. We encourage them to volunteer with either underrepresented communities, or encourage their employees to, or especially to figure out how their employees can volunteer with groups that are representative of their customers, of their customer base, uh, part of basic customer development. And then the follow is uh, the final one is about educating uh, oneself as a CEO, as a founder, um, as well as your workforce. Um, that is our team. We will tell you, I will tell you in a minute. Half of our partners are African American, not your standard VC issue. Three fourths of our investment team come from underrepresented backgrounds, either black or Latinx. Got another one here. We're slightly more than half women. Over half of our investments have a founder who is a woman and or a person from an underrepresented background. It skipped it. The last one said uh, an independent study, something called Project Diane, listed us as having invested in, there it is, having invested in more black women founders than any other venture capital firm, which is kind of sad because we're small. And it's not just by percentage. It is by um, absolute number. So I'm going to give you some examples of three of our founders and their, and their businesses. Uh, that's Phaedra on the left, Ellis Lampkins, uh, CEO of Promise, uh, was a YC company. Uh, we were her first investor. She is looking at uh, alternatives to cash bail. That's a very prevalent issue in our criminal justice system debate right now. That's an issue. Criminal justice reform is a bipartisan issue. A majority of Democrats and Republicans are supporting massive criminal justice reform, including alternatives to cash bail. The overwhelming majority, north of 70% of people who are sitting in county jails, are there because they, they have not yet been arraigned and they couldn't afford bail. So what happens while they're sitting there? For a couple weeks, they lose their jobs. You lose your job, you're not paying your rent, you lose your home, you lose your kids. It is, and a significant number are there for unpaid parking tickets. There are just these systemic ways in this society that just are these snowball effects. So Promise is working on many things, bringing some efficiency to the criminal justice system, in a, interjecting some tech in there. What she's found traveling around the country, talking to places right here in California, criminal justice system uses FileMaker Pro. I don't know if any of you even remember FileMaker Pro. Um, people are sitting in there waiting for their drug test results. And they can be waiting for a couple of weeks because the systems don't talk to each other. And somebody has to get the drug test result back on a piece of paper, and they have to re-input it, and then they print it out, and then they fax it to the jail. All of this could be done, of course, instantaneously. It could save taxpayers billions of dollars, and most importantly, it could save lives. It could save livelihoods. It could save families. So that's what promise, that's what Phaedra is. Uh, all about. Genius Plaza, Ana Roca Castro uh, is the founder. Uh, she is currently serving more than 15 million of the world's poorest students, children around the globe. Um, she 
landed in Cambodia today. She just texted me. She was in Africa last week. Her platform is available in more than 100 languages, including tribal languages around the Amazon and tribal languages in Africa. She has a lot of non-dilutive funding from places like the World Bank to do things in, in different uh, languages. She is highly profitable um, while doing uh, amazing gap-closing work. Her company is uh, based in Miami, and she literally has Sand Hill Road VCs hopping in their private jets, showing up at her office, saying, I brought my checkbook, and I'm not leaving until I invest. And she says, tell me about the diversity of your partners. I don't take money from VCs that don't have a diverse partnership. When we've, the, Anna's aspiration is to go public, and I'm on her board, and she's got the revenues to do it this year. Uh, she's not going to go out this year. Uh, but I'll tell you, when, when all three of these uh, become household names and the other mm -hmm. dozens in our portfolio, some different firms will sit up and take notice. Danelle at Block Power uh, is doing energy retrofits in core urban community buildings, churches, schools, community centers, housing projects. Um, so he's New York based, Anna is Miami based, Phaedra is Oakland based. Just three examples. I mentioned our People Ops Tech pitch competition. These are examples of some of the companies in our portfolio that are, that are building companies using tech to mitigate bias at scale. Um, so everything from Compass, which is a fairly new investment on our part, to uh, compensation, everything. Stock, uh, bonuses, base pay, everything into one system. Because again, those are computer systems. HR is running something different than payroll, is running something different than succession planning. How do you do that and how do you monitor for pay equity. The one above it, Techwitable, is a tech-enabled ombuds. Uh, way to get practical, neutral, confidential, problem-solving advice. SMASH, I mentioned, our Summer Math and Science Honors Academy, uh, started 16 years ago. Stanford was our second campus. Berkeley was our first campus. Uh, these are kids from public schools, 40, 50, 60% dropout rates. 16 years in, we have 100% high school graduation rate. We have 100% acceptance to four-year colleges rate. Uh, we are twice the national average. Our kids, all underrepresented, half girls since day one, our kids are pursuing STEM majors at twice the national average for all students. Uh, we're launching in Chicago at the Illinois Institute of Chicago. This year we're uh, in Carbondale, and we're opening at Northeastern in Boston and trying to change uh, tech. Some ideas to ponder and some things to spark your questions. This is my last slide here. So what if we measured distance travel instead of just finish lines? What if we could actually measure how far you got on your own steam? instead of how many degrees, how many certificates, how many points on a test you got. And wouldn't we find a different kind of trait? Certainly where I sit, I understand that SAT scores and GPAs are not predictors of successful entrepreneurs, right? I'm looking for what are those traits that predict successful entrepreneurs. We talk, what I showed you in the stories of Brandon and Juanita is in essence really a leaky tech pipeline. Where are all the places that talent leaks out? We've got more than a million unfilled tech jobs right now in this country, and as we clamp down on immigration, we are slowing our own GDP, we are slowing our own innovation by letting talent leak out of our homegrown system. What if we started measuring capabilities instead of pedigrees? 
what if we looked at, as we do on our investment criteria, what's a gap closing company versus a gap widening company? A very prominent local VC reached out to me about two weeks ago now and said, I have a company I think you're interested in, founded by two women. I said, great, tell me about it. Organic baby food. Margins north of 50%. What's the business model? Affluent families. Not gonna touch it. That's gap widening. When you run a business that promotes health disparities, I don't wanna help you. If you start a business that promotes disparities in educational outcomes, I don't wanna help you. I want people who wanna close those gaps, not widen those gaps. And again, as we think about this, whether you're a founder, an aspiring founder, an investor, a limited partner, an employee, an aspiring employee at a tech startup, I, I will assume that everybody in this room is well-intentioned. That if I asked you, do you want to make your coworkers' life miserable? Do you want to be, you know, do you want to exhibit bias towards your colleagues every day? You would say, absolutely not. But what we need to start focusing on is the impact. It's not enough to just be well-intentioned. We gotta look at the outcomes. If we have people leaving, dropping out of the pipeline, dropping out of tech companies, dropping out of the entrepreneurial journey in such disproportionate numbers, I'm a researcher. There's gotta be a reason, and we need to figure out what it is. And so we're not accusing anybody of anything. We're saying, let's look at the impact. Let's look at who our educational institutions and our workplaces, especially our startups, are designed by and for and see if we can fix that. Okay, time for questions. Those are some of our smash scholars. <laughs> so, kick us off. How much uh, blowback did you get for your Uber letter and what were, what were your lessons learned? Uh, so, does everybody know what he's referring to? Got a lot of head shaking, no. Um, so we are a seed stage investor in Uber. Um, not a bad position to be in. Um, and two years ago, after Susan Fowler wrote her blog post about having what it was like as a woman engineer to work there, uh, we wrote a public letter, we being my husband and myself. Uh, my husband is the founder of Lotus Development, the creator of Lotus 123 Spreadsheet, founder of Electronic Frontier Foundation, <coughs> founding board chair of Mozilla. Um, so um, Mitch and I wrote a letter that said, this is not okay. We've been talking to you about these issues for a long time. Uh, you call us every time there's an issue, we give you advice and you don't follow it. If, em if an employee writing that blog post isn't enough, your investors, that, that, that all of us need to take a stand on what kind of companies there are. The blowback we got, so first of all, we got a lot of positive. Um, we got a lot of people saying, thank you for saying it, I've been thinking that, but I wouldn't stick my neck out, which you can just put those folks over in a group and decide if that's okay or not. Um, but what was fascinating is Anna, the one in the middle, Anna Roca Castro of Genius Plaza, of three of the entrepreneurs I profiled for you. Um, Anna, I was on stage with her at southbysouthwest.edu two years ago, about a month or so after um, we had written that letter. And she said, she popped this surprise thing in front of the audience on me. She said, so what would you say a prominent investor whose name you would all recognize right here came up to me 
at a meeting last, came up to Anna, at a meeting last week and said, you ought to get, remove them as investors. They'll turn on you the way they turned on Uber. And what Anna said is, that's why I wanted them on as investors, and I will never let your firm invest in my company, is what she said to that person's face. So when we all take a stand, we know who we are. And entrepreneurs, we say to our entrepreneurs every day of the week, be really careful about who's on your cap table. It's a different kind of marriage, it's a marriage. They're there as long as, until you have an exit and they're the ones that can throw you out. Given what you've told us about your criteria for investment, mm -hmm. gap closing rather than gap widening, mm -hmm. why would you invest in Uber in the first place given its gig employment model which is arguably gap widening? Very good question. So we invested in Uber in 2009. We, did a, we became 100% gap closing investing in 2011. And our returns that we're releasing are 2011 through the end of 2017, 100% of a gap closing portfolio. And we ask ourselves a lot, would we do that investment today? Knowing what we know now, no. But at, at the early part, we're not sure. One of the earliest studies uh, that was done of Uber and it was that African American men who are physicians, who are lawyers, who are, you know, who are getting out of the hospital at 11 at night, leaving the law firm at midnight in New York City could not get a taxi. Uber became an incredibly important way for communities that were ignored by the taxi industry to get a safe ride home. That's important. There are all kinds of other things. I mean, as my husband often says about Uber, it's a great second job. It is not a great first job. So I talk to Uber drivers all the time who, and any of you who use any of the ride-hailing companies, they've become a bit of commodities now, and most drivers drive for Lyft and Uber in the US. And you ask them, and a lot of them are saying, somebody I had recently said, look, I'm studying to install solar roof panels. And when I was a contract car service driver, I couldn't do that. I had fixed hours, and if I didn't like my hours, and so I could never get the classes I needed. Now, I can take my classes, I can drive when I want, during finals week, I don't drive at all, and I am on my way to that degree that I could get no other way. So you have to think about all of the trade-offs, and, and I think that your, your point is well taken. Yes? So one of your first slides was about people under the age of 50. Um, um, and so you have a long-term view of what's happened. Um, I worked in the industry 30 years ago, and from what I'm hearing mm -hmm. now, things have gotten worse for women in a lot of ways. What's your perspective on what's changed, what, what happened, um, you know, like kind of your diagnosis of, of that, and, and obviously you have great ideas about how to fix stuff, but things got worse in this Things got area. much worse. Uh, so there were more women getting computer science degrees and working in tech in the 1980s than there are now. Um, and um, there are a bunch of reasons for that, and a lot of people have written about that. And if you want to, I know we're trying to watch time a little bit here, but if, you'll, if you want to talk about that, I am happy to talk about it. And a lot of things are being published now. A lot of folks are saying, so first of all, Startups, internet startups, the, it's a whole different kind of culture uh, than the companies that were around in the 80s. I mean, we were sort of one of the first software. Um, it was, it, back then, it was packaged software, right? Sold in computer stores. People don't even know what that is today. Uh, but if you think about the hardware companies, if you've seen a movie like Hidden Figures, you know that the early, early, early work in of uh, computer scientists, programmers, it was women's work. 
um, it was thought to be clerical. Um, and so there's the whole what happens during wars and women getting recruited in and then pushed out of the workplace. So there are many, many, many factors. But um, your point is important. There were many more. The, pro the proportion of women technologists, computer scientists in companies, especially in large tech companies, was much greater and has gone down steadily. It's on an uptick again um, because of all of these programs. But, and all of the attention to it, but that's a very recent uptick. Another question, yes, sir. There's a lot of focus on diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. Um, I'm assuming, like, is, this, is that objectively worse than in places like Wall Street or other types of industries, or is it just that there's more awareness in there? Um, it is, uh, it is, the numbers, uh, the representation in tech is worse than just about any other sector. Uh, it's also a sector with um, huge opportunity, with more than, as I mentioned, more than a million open current jobs. Uh, so it is an industry that needs to attract talent. Uh, so th that mismatch is even greater. We yes. Have one more question. You're it. So this is kind of a loaded question, but Good. I kind of you're talking a lot about diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. and speaking in terms of poverty, I think that a huge issue that comes with this is the widening wealth gap in America, mm -hmm. and how much wealth people actually control, which can be generational wealth, or for other reasons. I know you could probably talk about this forever, but what do you think is the are the clear next steps that we should be taking, either as individuals or like as a country, towards tackling this huge problem, which is still going to exist, even if we're investing in these companies that you are, mm -hmm. people are still being born into these zip codes that can't get them into school with this, for example. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question, and I think it's a perfect thing as you kick off a whole look at values. I think the tech ecosystem as a whole needs to hold up a mirror on many of these issues, including our, I'm not saying that I haven't been part of it, I have for decades, the tech ecosystem's responsibility for hastening and exacerbating wealth inequality in this country. And therefore, I would say, a heightened responsibility to fix it. Um, there are a lot of very specific things. I mean, about as unpopular with venture capitalists as our Uber letter was our public statements about getting rid of carried interest. There's an awful lot that can and should be done um, that, would, that would begin to, to close some of those gaps. But, you know, again, as a researcher, or if you want to look at it as a lean startup perspective, understanding the breadth, depth, and nuance of the problem is really the first step to, to solving it. Uh, and I think we haven't done that in a, in a real deep, thoughtful, nuanced, iterative way.